So hello everyone. I am delighted to be joined here today by Samantha Blanchard. Sam completed her degree in journalism at the New Zealand Broadcasting School before working for national talkback radio station Radio Live for three years. After spending a decade overseas, she returned to the South Island of New Zealand and helped found an independent newspaper called the GB Thinker when vaccine mandates split her local community. Um, her new documentary, Silenced, is her first video production, and we're going to dive into that today. So first of all, Sam, thank you for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. And so I'm excited that we've, we've arranged this interview because you've just had your premiere of this amazing new documentary, Silenced. But before we jump into that, um, my first question for everyone, I think it's a nice, inspiring question for people to hear, you know, your answer to, is a little bit of background, whatever you'd like to share. And then when was that awakening moment for you? When did you realise that things are not the way that we thought they were? New Zealand went into its first lockdown in April 2020. And... Um, in the beginning, I was such a supporter of Jacinda Ardern. I thought we were so, I felt so safe. I felt really looked after um, because none of us knew what was going on. And it was crazy and it felt strange and everyone was scared and, and it felt like things were really under control and being controlled. And, and it felt really comforting at the time. But things things started to feel strange about it. Um, around that time, in the UK, there were uh, 5G tower burnings. And because I had all this time on my hands, it was lockdown. I started to look into 5G around that time and the safety of it. And I could see that there was no consensus on it actually being safe, which is debatably entirely unrelated to all of this. But I just started to question because I could see that something was being accepted without question. And then as things started to roll on and New Zealand was New Zealand remained locked down from the rest of the world while we were all still free here, we we were our, our borders were locked. So we were life continued on here, but it was we were watching the world. So there was plenty of time to feel normal, but watch on and do the research. And I called on my old journalism degree and started to do the research as, as rumours of misinformation and things flew around, I applied my skills and started following the trails of peer-reviewed studies, in particular related to repurposed drugs and early treatment. Um, I found this to be a, real, a really hot trail of unanswered questions and strange retractions from big time journals and um and i just started to smell a rat and continued to smell a rat and then could see as i started to gather in around me people who were starting to feel the same thing and we were all doing the research and finding different things out it started to come together and um and i could see that they were going to force man uh, mandates and vaccinations on us that didn't happen though until the end of 2021 when it was only omicron coming through new zealand and when it was much more degraded than it had been in terms of um, of danger and by then our community was divided if not i mean it was already headed in that way but i live in a small a, a semi-rural a rural community and the mandates totally divided us, separated us. Um, and a community like this really thrives from unity. It's integral to a strong community, you know, divide and conquer, etc. So it was devastating. Um, and I lost, I, I worked, I was actually managing a pub at the time, an iconic music venue here in New Zealand. It's rural, it's in the corner of the South Island. And at the time there were zero cases in the whole of the South Island. All of the cases when the mandates came in were all in Auckland, which was still locked down. Yet we had mask mandates come in 
in the South Island, in a rural pub in the corner of the country when there are zero cases on the island. And I thought, I can't put up with this. This is not sane. This is, this is silly. This is asking me to do something that I can see and feel is counterintuitive and quite stupid. So I quit that job before the vaccine mandates came in, although people assured me that that's where it was heading and that's where it did head. And I trusted that something more important, uh, something more worthy of my time than a job in hospitality would come along. And there was a little bit of journey between that and starting the documentary, but that started to feed through after I started this newspaper, which had a distribution of a thousand in print um, little four page newspapers that went around the place that I live and just started to bring some balance to the media, um, including interviews and peer reviewed studies, et cetera, et cetera. And then the documentary came through again via trust. I didn't know what I was doing. I've never made one before, but I knew I wanted to and I knew it was kind of. It felt, it, felt, it felt channeled. I knew that I had to make one. It was almost like a conversation, like, is that what I'm doing? God, okay, all right, making a documentary. I didn't even know what it, is, what it was about, but there was a lot of synchronicity along the way, and I just trusted, and then I got this interview with the, you could say the lead um, figure at the beginning of Silence. His name's Peter Williams. He's very familiar to New Zealanders because he's been on our screens, screens and mainstream media for a long time. And we spoke to each other about a different issue, but I reapproached him to talk about why he left media, which was because of an issue to do with freedom of speech and not being allowed to ask questions of the COVID narrative because of issues revealed in the documentary. I made this proposal to him Two days later, he phoned me back and he said, Sam, I'm not very enthusiastic about your proposition. I was like, oh, how, do I, how do I make you interested? And he said, but I'm in, I'm in the region. He's not from here. He's not from anywhere close to here. He's about 10 hours, he's at least a 10-hour drive away, but he was here for the second time ever in his life. And I managed to arrange an interview in about an hour and a location, cameraman and everything that I needed for that. And we did the interview and it's it's the keystone, it's the draw card for New Zealanders because he's familiar and credible. And then we fleshed it out with another very credible academic who's a sociologist who it was time for to, to interview. It was time for the sociological perspective. We've moved on from the epidemiology. And then the GP as well to cover these different realms where censorship has been experienced in our society and all over the world. So sorry, I enlarged on your your uh, question there and kind of took a, a whole overview from, from the beginning to the end, but um, that is what that is. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. So, um, so I'm just trying to get the names up. Yeah, so Peter Williams then is, you know, a well-known radio talk show host in uh, in New Zealand. Um, what 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 was the reason why he said, I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure about this in the beginning, and then what changed? Right. Um, he wasn't sure about it because it was, it's dicey, you know. To speak out is, it's freaky. It's like, um, and he didn't want to be the center of it. He'd retired, he'd left the public eye, and I think he was ready to sink into his retirement. He didn't, he just wanted to relax. He's got a beautiful home, central Otago. He just wanted to retire. He's ready for it. He's pushing 70 now. And to speak out on this front, and he names names as well. Um, you know, he's 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 playing with fire. Um but I feel like now, and, and one of the, to answer the second part of your question, something that eased it for him was that I assured him that he wouldn't be the center of the piece. 
that we would even it out with um, other people with just as much of a story to tell. Um, perhaps they're not as, as you know, their, their, their public familiarity maybe isn't as, um, you know, maybe they're not as recognisable. But I think the way that the documentary is made, certainly, He's, he is the draw card, Peter Williams. People know him. But once you're into it and you've seen his story told, you've been introduced already to our other key figures who have just as much heat to bring to the conversation. Um, they're fantastic. They're incredible women, the other two as well. And did you... I'm putting you on the spot now, but did uh, has he seen it? Did he give you a response on what he thought about the final product? I just texted him just before um, I came onto this, just to check in with him. I know that he's really busy. Um, he's seen half of it. I just needed to check that the material that we were using of him a few weeks ago was was that he was happy with, um, and he's certainly happy with with what we've done with him. And I haven't touched base with him since he's seen the final product. He now, I'm happy to say, is back on the air on a fresh, new, independent radio station here in New Zealand called Real Reality Check Radio. And it's brilliant. They've got four fantastic, well, they've got several more actually, but four key hosts, including Peter, who's returned. And, um, and, are digging into the, the counter narrative stuff, not just COVID and vaccines, but also climate change and um, and kind of attacking woke media. They're digging into all sorts of things, and it's uh, you know health in general, and and how it's kind of been flipped over the years in terms of what me what health means, and you know they're not afraid. They're unafraid. <laughs> their their skin is thick from the last two or three years, and they're going for it. And it's so cool. So it's great to see him back on here. And that just that only launched two or three weeks before the launch of this documentary. So I think they partner each other quite well. Yeah, and it's exciting also, I think, with the reality check radio that it's, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm focused on the solutions and that is the solution. This is the type of radio station that we need out there. Yeah. Ju just as your documentary is the type of conversation that should be out there. Mm. Um, so... There's so many questions I can ask about the documentary, but the, the central theme for me of this documentary was the censorship, the censorship of the conversation. What was the, you know, for you, who, who is the audience? What is the intention? What, do you, what, do you, what is the, the message that you're trying to convey in this documentary? The audience that we are aiming for is absolutely, okay. Um, I'll go back to the intention first. The intention actually is to heal. To so many relationships have been hurt over the last two or three years. And in my view, they've been hurt by a disparity of information. And I think a lot of New Zealanders, a lot of the world feel as though mainstream media is the only thing that they can trust and everything else is out the gate and untrustworthy. But what this documentary seeks to be and what I've been very careful in terms of my presentation with it is that it's credible and it is in the format that New Zealanders would be familiar with, bar the beauty of the nature, um, which just adds to some softness. It's presented in the very, in the mainstream media way. It feels like you're watching I don't know if you guys have 60 Minutes over there or 2020, these old current affairs programs that unfortunately we don't have here in New Zealand anymore, which is another story. Um, but it's presented in a very mainstream way and it's bulletproof. It had to be bulletproof in terms of facts. It is factual. It's mostly, it's, it's logical. It's mostly logical. And I say it's mostly logical because there is um, the emotional factor, which... Um, drawn from from some of the way that we use nature I think um, and pause for people to to reflect on what we've been through um, but the intention was to heal to for people who can already 
see that we've been lied to, to say to their friends and family who think that we're crazy or dangerous even, which is here in New Zealand how some mainstream media outlets have apparently uh, sought to to portray us in this way that there's certainly there's a couple of documentaries here in New Zealand which are um, incredi- incredibly hurtful actually and extremely dangerous the way that they've portrayed people who are seeking um, freedom and freedom of choice freedom of speech and, and just discussion and asking questions uh, one of them is is spoken about in the documentary it's called fire and fury and it's just it makes makes somebody like me look crazy and dangerous and right wing and all the rest of it we know this the heart of this documentary yearned to show that we're reasonable kiwis asking reasonable questions this was the baseline mantra throughout and i really wanted to stick close to that idea that the questions, the communication, freedom of speech, censorship. This is the core message. And I'm so glad that it came through to you as a central message because it could easily have come through as a as another anti-vax documentary. I don't want we didn't want that. It's so polarizing, pro and anti-vax. We're not out to um, um, we're not out to crucify anyone for their choices here. We're just saying that actually one of the points I think made in the documentary is that we weren't given all of the choices. There could have been more than just one or the other. It's very simple. And in fact, Jody Brunning uses the words dumbed down, not more than, she uses those words twice in the documentary. She's the sociologist um, that I interviewed. She's wonderful. And that is, I mean, when you look at the choice that we were given, pro or anti, yes or no, it's extremely dumbed down. We're smarter than that. We've got way more choices than that. And it's become clear, though it's not clear to the mainstream audience, that there's lots of different options for how we could have dealt with this crisis. And had there have been more open-mindedness and more discussion, then we could have we could have been a lot more reasonable in the way that we dealt with things. Um, you know, and again, you've got commercial interests to consider <laughs> or not, mm. if not consider those maybe in a world in the future. But, um, you know, those are the intentions. But the, the seed of the documentary, I want to share this with you, is um, before all of this, before I got back into my journalism, kind of old myself out of, hiding from this random skill set that I acquired for myself 15 years ago and turned my back on thinking I never want to go back to the news what a horrible place to work no I kind of like before before I went back to it I would phone my family and go this is crazy what's going on why are we only getting one side of the story why (laughs) because it was impacting on things yeah to do with me It, it impacted on my attendance at my brother's wedding. I wasn't allowed to attend my brother's wedding because it took place during the mandates and that was devastating, not just for me, but for my parents and everybody involved and I'm still getting over that. But raging at my family about the situation was not going to solve it. And my mother said to me, on one of those conversations, she raged back at me. She said, why don't you go and do something about it then? And I was pretty stumped really. I said in my little speech at the premiere last night, her words hung from the conversation like my old Juno degree on the wall. And I realized Gandhi had reincarnated as a frustrated English woman, (laughs) steering me in the direction of being the change that I wished to see in the world. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> Pick up that pen, I'm gonna do something. And I really invited it in. There was one night, um, it would have been winter in 2021. I was doing the research and blowing my own mind and like finding out all of this stuff that wasn't coming through to the mainstream. And I walked around my house going, 
out loud, I live alone, out loud, universe, I'm ready. Make me a journalist again. <laughs> like, come through me, do what you need to do. Let's work together. Reluctantly, I'm ready. Let's do it. And it's been a real process and practice of trust ever since then. Um, and uh, it's beautiful the way that a creative process unfolds when you just trust because it is a creative process and I'm fairly spiritual and perhaps esoteric in the way that I come across, but the documentary is very factual and logical and mainstream and straight down the barrel and um, it's driven from the heart, but it comes from facts and data and legends who are speaking not just from their heart, but from true knowledge that they've acquired and cultivated and work on day to day to day. And um, it's another process of channeling to just simply show their story as well. It's, it's not about me, it's about presenting the story and just storytelling. It's a pleasure to tell a good story. I, I think that uh, when you say it's not about me, it's about their story. Um, so to talk a little bit about that spirituality and the esoteric side is like you know, what you're talking about now, obviously, is, you know, connecting to the intuition, connecting to the heart space, to the universe, whatever language you want to use it, use and leaving out the ego and doing something from the heart. And what comes across for me in this documentary we were mentioned before we started recording that the silence in there and the nature it's like it, it bring it, it it brings in that that the kind of the emotion um to a, a, a an emotion and a piece to a story which can actually be quite um horrific when we really think about the the amount of censorship that's been going on but at the same time, the three people that you have in the documentary are also, you know, very grounded. They're coming from it from a, a place of sense. You know, there's not there's not a you know somebody in there who's angry and shouting in this camera and things like that. It's mm. all very much a balanced. It feels balanced. It doesn't, mm. it, it, you know what I mean? It, like it's a yeah, conversational and calm. This is, this is feedback that we've had a lot of the, the calm nature of it measured is something that a lot of people have come back with and calm and measured, but still alarming or calm and measured, but still concerning. You know, it's material that is, um, is perhaps worrying, but you're kept calm throughout. Like perhaps where it wasn't necessarily an intention as I was doing it, but maybe we're looking after people's nervous systems at the same time as delivering them information that they need to be aware of and that's uncomfortable. But, yeah, I think you're right. The, the three people that we interviewed are perfect for that. And um, in terms of reaching our target audience, which are the ones that we've been embattled with, the ones that we can share this with who haven't seen the other side and go, yeah, look, this isn't scary. No one's going to shout at you. Like you say, it's not fire and fury. It's not, it's not crazy anti-vaxxers. It's, it's not out the gate. I have an interview tomorrow with uh, the Free Speech Union here in New Zealand, which is special because the Free Speech Union is an outfit that has organised itself just in the last three years as well, but they have not done a lot of um, material or they haven't focused much on the whole COVID narrative stuff but they feel as though they can with this documentary because it's not, while it deals with that, it's more so, like you say, dealing with censorship and freedom of speech, which is what they're concerned with. And, and our interview will, will stay focused on that. And it's very important that it does not to come into that polarization. And this was another part of the, the contention. What has happened to us is this 
divide that started here but continued like this and the disparity of information has just become wider and wider and wider we've become further and further apart the polarization and this documentary seeks to bring it back to what unites us freedom of speech it has to it has to be where we unite this bedrock of our democracy we must uphold that look back in history all the great philosophers have been have something to say about freedom of speech there's no one that says to just follow along with what you're being told. There's no one that says go the way of authority without questioning it. It's not a thing. We that that's a must. And if we highlight that to everyone, then I, I think that we can find unity again. It's about this documentary seeks to heal. Yeah, I was going to say it's a uh, you know it feels like it's a, a healing. Do, uh, it, you know, you, you can feel that the intention coming from it is healing. It's not fight, flight, freeze. And mm -hmm. there's also some documentaries also, not only from the mainstream media, but also from, you know, the alternative truth freedom movement that just create more panic. And this is, this is very much, you know, a healing. And what I love about what you just said there is, I often talk about, you know, let's unite despite our differences with a oneness of purpose. And, and, and as a general term, that oneness of purpose could be freedom. But what you're talking about is freedom of choice, um, you know, for, uh, for, uh, you know the, the, the freedom of debate, the freedom to discuss. And these are things that in a rational world, uh, you know, would everybody would agree that this is a good idea to have open discussion, open debate. And also what you mentioned about how, you know, there's people out there that say, you know, you, you're, you're silly for taking the jab, you're silly for not taking the jab. But our, our choices were so limited. Everything was so, was so censored and controlled that we didn't have the full picture to make decisions from. Um, and add to that the fear, just really like, take those take that limited choice and just pressurize it with the fear um you know um my sister told me straight up she went out and got vaccinated because of her mental health for her mental health not for her physical health for her mental health and um i accepted her decision but that's ultimately that's absolutely coercion it's, it's Oh, yeah. going, she was going crazy otherwise. Yeah, many Stealing. people just to get keep their job as well, you know. So many reasons that were not their own true heart-driven reasons. They had to make that choice. They were they were driven into it by outside factors or factors unrelated to what it should have been about. It should have been about their own health, but their own physical health or I'd like to mention, um, so you've got Jody Brunning, who's a sociologist, Peter Williams, the radio talk show host. Uh, Anne O'Reilly is the, the medical doctor who's now deregistered. Um, but then there's also Dr. Simon Thornley, who you interviewed, but couldn't put that content in there. Um, yeah. Was... was Simon Thornley going to be a, a, a big part of the documentary originally, or what, what happened there yeah. with, with, with uh, Mr. Mr. Thornley? I really wanted to meet, first meet and then interview and then have Dr. Thornley's input because he, for me, was the first brazen voice to speak up and really do something about what was going on. He's an epidemiologist from Auckland University and his website, COVID Plan B, is still up. He was prolific in publishing so much information onto that website, referencing all of it in, the, in that first year and challenging. And he wasn't totally censored. He was given some, he was given a little bit of a mouthpiece, um, but then he was... Um, slated by more populist experts and, and closely um, closely associated with a disinformation agenda. 
unfortunately, at the end of 2021, he hastily published a paper which had to be retracted. And that marked the end of him speaking out because of issues with his employment, which I won't go on any more about, but you can probably put two and two together. We did an interview with him, even though he was silenced and it was under the terms that it would be embargoed until he was allowed to speak. And then that moment would never come. His lawyers advised him not to, not to speak out at all. He remains employed. Um, and <laughs> the fact that we can't have an epidemiologist um, who had a different view on things safely speak about his position even in hindsight at this point should be deeply concerning for people particularly as when you look back on his published findings on COVID on COVID plan B um, you will find that they were all referenced as I mentioned and it's an incredible body of work there's like it's huge and he just he works so hard and you know it's all based on truth it's an incredible it's an incredible body of work for the 20 for 2020 2021 the discussion in in those uh, pages of COVID plan b is far reaching deep broad and um you know this is uh, yeah and and he was brave and he was so brave and he's genuine he's just a bloody good kiwi honestly um and yeah it really saddens me that he's he's not more allowed in our, in our public sphere but fortunately i think we vindicate him in this documentary and that's really cool um interestingly when i phoned jody brunning uh the sociologist who would take because the the documentary looks at censorship in these three realms, media, medicine, and academia. And Jodie Brunning takes the role of academia or, or represents the realm of academia and looking at society and norms and values and what's gone on here. And when I first approached her, she asked me, well, have you gone to Simon Thornley? She was kind of scoping me out. She didn't know who I was and she was reluctant at first to um, to be a part of the project. But also he's the obvious one to go to because he's he's the epidemi he was the dissenting epidemiologist in New Zealand. He's mentioned at the beginning of the real Anthony Fauci in, in the foreword and the uh, list of people that um, RFK Jr. is grateful for in the world for speaking out. And uh, I said to Jody, well, yes, I have spoken to Dr. Thornley. Interestingly, we're not allowed to use that interview. And she said, well, that's kind of beautiful, isn't it? We can use that. And it, it's amazing how when you give trust to a project, um, even the setbacks, because I could feel that the week before Simon Thornley pulled out, which was about three months after we did his interview, I could feel it coming. I was like, okay, I don't think this is going to come through for some reason, pretty sure. But I, it was very quick. Jody, going to Jody was the immediate idea that came in to, to soothe the fact that I was going to lose the epidemiologist. And when he gave me that news, I was like, okay all good let's just use it and fortunately we're just those are the facts we have, we interviewed and we're not allowed to use it people we don't need to know the reasons people can put two and two together it's not hard so we protect him at the same time as telling his story and, and vindicating him and he deserves to be vindicated he had a really measured approach to offer and you know had there not have been so much fear built up around it then we could have taken that measured approach but then again had there not been so many billions of dollars riding on it then we could have taken a more measured approach i'm sure 
these are the things that we should learn. And when you talk about vindication should be vindicated again, it's about the kind of the healing and, um, you know, the, 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 the other, um, cent- kind of main person featured in the documentary is Anna O'Reilly, who also was a medical doctor and had to deregister, um, because of the pressure that was put upon her. Um, so yeah, maybe just a little bit about uh, Anna O'Reilly's role in the story and kind of you mentioned that there's the academic, the media and then the medical. So um, what what did you want to get across in the documentary about the medical side? I mean, not only about COVID and stuff, but also you talk about diet, you talk about functional medicine and you you talk about, you know, that that's not even considered as as important. Um, and then also, of course, she she found she co-founded the New Zealand Doctors uh, SOS, speaking out with science. I think so. A little bit about that medical aspect of the documentary. Sure. So it comes back to censorship again. Doctors who had important questions, where they were advocating for their patients, in alignment their ethical requirements of their profession, we're not allowed to ask those questions or they they were allowed to ask them, but they were ignored. And then the questions themselves were suppressed. So NZD, SOS or New Zealand Doctors Speaking Out With Science was written off by media here, red flagged. And um, yeah, the way that they were treated in the beginning when they were first founded was just Horrific. They were made to seem in mainstream media like they were dangerous. And they were advocating for their patients. And I think Dr. O'Reilly comes across again. She's calm. She's measured. She's, you want, if I was to have a personal GP, I don't even have a personal GP these days, but if I were to have one or a family doctor, she's the ideal. She's who you want. It's a lovely lady. She's not angry. I'm sure she's experienced anger, but she's calm and measured, passionate, reasonable, just, just an ordinary, lovely woman with a fantastic repertoire of skills, well rounded with this extra training in functional medicine, which looks at the root cause of the problem when it comes to illness in terms of diet, lifestyle, stress management, sleep, which made her question, why in traditional medicine do we just throw pills at people? You know, my words, not hers. Um, That was when she started to question and that was 20 years ago. So she's well prepared for this. She's been questioning traditional medicine for a long time. She's known for a long time that medical journals are uh, uh, compromised and so she was already positioned in that way but I think I hope the way that we've conveyed that piece of information which is very important enlightens some people if we can get it across to those people who are not already aware of this stuff that these issues are deeper than just this pandemic that health itself is, has been compromised for a while now and our traditional medical system actually is um, is steered toward drugs and profits rather than diet and lifestyle changes in order to fix up your own machine. Like, you know, it's um, so counterintuitive. It seems like it's been entirely flipped and uh, I think perhaps we get that across in the documentary in a very short time. I hope we do. It feels like right now like we do. Sometimes I look back on the whole piece and think, do we do that? Do we do that? I'm, I still love watching it, which is weird. I've seen it probably about 50 times and I still think it's quite a fun watch. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot of juice in there. She goes through, Dr. O'Reilly goes through um, the the forms, the volunteer voluntary undertakings that the medical council gave to our doctors which 
ask them to, well, they were gag orders basically. And if they didn't sign these this, these agreements to basically stop sharing their views publicly and refer their patients to other doctors if they asked anything about COVID management. Um, and if they didn't sign these things, then they would be suspended. So they certainly weren't voluntary, even though that's what they were titled. And all of that was suppressed as well. The public doesn't know about that. The public doesn't know about the treatment of these doctors who are trying to advocate for informed consent. Um, yeah, that's that's without without telling you what's what's in the the piece itself. Yeah, that's that's the medical part of it's the third part of the tripod. <laughs> that's well, I. I would say that definitely all comes across and the, yeah, I'm, I mean, the reason, like I said, you know, that I enjoyed it so much is just because it's, um, yeah, it's, it's doing the opposite of fight, flight, freeze. It's, it's really bringing people back to a grounded perspective and, you know, and this is what we need. We need just like with, you know, the reality check radio, this is the type of documentary we need out there as well. Something which isn't riling people up or dividing people, but actually bringing people together. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, I usually finish with a question at the end, like what would your advice be for people that are kind of struggling in these times? But you sent me a message before we did the interview that you also have some advice on how to kind of put a story together. And I was wondering if, you know, if there's people out there who, you know, they have some creativity coming out, they can feel that they want to express something creative that could help, that could mm -hmm. to do something about it, rather mm -hmm. than just throwing the information at people, which also I, we've all done that, it doesn't work, but to yeah. actually create something as a kind of a positive solution. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps you have some advice on how to put that creativity into practice. Right. Um, the piece of advice that I wanted to share is um, the, the basis of my storytelling is I, I have a, a little bit of an idea of what I want to tell and I'll, I'll create my interview questions around that idea. Kind of just an, and an interview firstly should be looked at like a chat, just like this is. It's, it's, it's easy and it's relaxed. It doesn't have to be this big thing where you've structured all these questions. In fact, one question to start with is often enough. That's all you need. And then you just go and see and explore. I think the basis of a good story, if you want to do some journalism, if you have someone that you want to interview and you want to create a story from what they have to tell, if you record it and you transcribe it, there are apps that can do that for you. Okay, Simon says it's called, but if you if you do that, go through and pick the best quotes and let them let the best quotes of the interview be the basis for your story. You don't have to know how you're going to write this crazy story. Don't be daunted by the mountain, but allow your talent, your interviewee, to come through with the magic. Have the conversation. Have a relaxed chat. Don't worry about what's coming through. Just have a good yarn and then rely on what comes through. Have an ear out for any good quotes and take a note. You might even want a time code, but that will take your attention away from the chat. Wait until after when you've transcribed, go through and find the best quotes, take them out and put the best quotes on a couple of pages. They're the basis for your story. Go from there and build the story around the best quotes because those best quotes, they're your truth bombs. They are, they'll tell the story for you. You can rely on that. All you have to do around that is kind of, um, you know, uh, flesh it out. They are the skeleton. You've got the structure or the, you've, got the, um, the, you've got the meat actually. And from there you, you build around that. It's the best piece of advice. I think it's, the be it's, it's what makes, it's what made silent. It what's, it's what makes all of my stories for the GB thinker. It's your, when you interview somebody else, you become objective. There's too much of subjective opinion in journalism these days where journalists are writing what 
they think and what they've found out and what they've deduced and their opinion, which is not journalism, can be if it's totally factually based, fine, but go and interview someone, let them be the story and tell their story. It takes you out of it, telling somebody else's story. And then you present that, having built around their quotes. And the objectivity of that or the, the telling of somebody else's story is much more easy to, for people to digest than you delivering your information to somebody. Tell someone else's story. Tell other people's stories like you are here. Like create the platform, write the story, but around what somebody else has to tell. Fantastic advice. And, you know, that's, so, yeah, like you said, similar to what I'm doing is just um, – just listening to other people's amazing stories and just and my the, the the main message that i want to get out there is that ordin like everyday ordinary people can do, can can be the ones that we're waiting for and, and yeah. you know that and we're we're all we're all being called to do what we can to uh to create this the world that we'd like to live in yeah um we, we, we can start to wrap up now, I think, because, you know, we've done about an hour. But um, do you have any advice? Sorry to throw this one on you as well. But do you have any advice for people that, you know, that are just struggling, um, struggling with, as you say, you know, like division um, and especially this kind of doom and gloom, like the future is is could go down this terrible totalitarian route and a kind of living in that fear and that worry? For me, it's a practice of presence and or being with nature every day, if possible. If possible. Um, I meditate most days and it's, it's not, I don't know if meditation, but it's simply, sometimes I feel like it's escapism because I'm just, I'm leaving all of that, the future, in the past out I'm just focusing on my breath and just like I'm not acknowledging any of that stuff right now well it's there and it might come back into my head but I'm gonna get rid of it again I'm gonna come back to my breath repeatedly and there's nothing when you're focusing on just your breath or just right now or just relaxing or or some practice of mindfulness I just focus on my breath and when you truly can just focus on that simplicity of your breath, um, there's a peace there, but it does come with practice. And you can tap into that peace and feel it no matter what's going on. The future is not here yet. The past is not here yet, but you can create peace for yourself daily by just doing that, by just focusing on your breath. Or if it's nature, if, you're, if you can get into some nature and it may just be with a tree, but just being really mindful or really curiously interested in the details of that tree, of the bark or of the leaves or how the sun's shining through it or of the forest floor beneath your feet. Practicing, practicing, because it's a continual practice of just being with that. Because in that moment, all of the future in the past, particularly the future and what could be coming if we don't get our act together, that's not here and now, it's not. And when you bring your nervous system back to that, uh, back to that base of peace and make this practice out of cultivating that, then you're there you could be there daily or you could be there every other day and then you're there more often than you were and uh, you create peace for yourself by making it into a practice and it becomes easier and easier and you settle down more and more and uh, this time of crisis the last few years has driven me toward that more and more I had a bit of a practice in place prior to now but um this has made me realize how powerful that is. Wonderful. I would also add that when you when you can uh, increase the amount of time that you're in the present, that that's also when you get that the channeling, 
you were talking about yeah you know the the, the charge yes yeah you become clearer yeah it's so powerful in so many ways and it's only to be discovered by you yourself in practice and it takes time you have to be patient but it happens Sam, uh, just to finish, uh, links, websites, where can people find the documentary? Where can people find the GB Thinker and um, any other sites, links you'd like to share? Yeah, um, silenced.co.nz. That's silenced with a D on the end, silenced.co.nz. It's also on Vimeo or it's embedded into the website and uh, Rumble. Um, the GB Thinker is on Facebook. Um, facebook.com forward slash the GB thinker or maybe GB thinker. Um, and yeah, I think that's all for me. That's my stuff that's online anyway. Would you like to share what's coming next or are you at this moment um, just kind of reveling in the final product and then finally <laughs> silence is out there? Yeah, silence is out there. We, we have some sort of marketing and things that we need to do now and, and keeping on top of the internet takeoff, which is pretty exciting, but we need to drive it. But um, otherwise, I'm having a break for a week. Um, I've taken a week off from my other job and I'm just going to rest because we need to look after number one before we look after the rest of the world. And I've been working really hard on this and just need to stop for a bit. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I don't know what's next. I, I'd like to make more documentaries. I think I've got a strength in storytelling. And though I'm reluctant to do so, actually, um, I think I need to follow the journalism thing. And maybe maybe just the next one I make is, is solutions-focused. Um, this one while calm and measured like you say it's it's highlights it highlights uh it brings light to the darkness uh, which needs to happen it's important but i just want to bring more light to the lightness maybe next project <laughs> yeah there's i've got a few ideas bubbling but um we'll just see what happens i'm not sure yet and i'm again trusting that it'll come through and be clear when it's meant to after rest <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. I'm in a very similar situation to you. Like I also now just need to increase my rest time, um, you know, and to get that balance between the being and the doing, because mm -hmm. it's very yeah. easy to jump into one or the other, you yeah. know, to just be or to just do. And yeah. then, of course, the difficult one is how do you, you know, to, to get that really nice balance between the two. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's when you're that's when that's when you hit flow state i think and that's, i think you need it, that balance to happen to hit flow state anyway and to just be again it just means like when you need to rest rest when you need to work work when the idea comes through activate it it's so nice when that happens well i'm super excited to find out whatever does come next and uh, I really genuinely uh, loved the documentary. I think it's just got a wonderful energy to it and a powerful message. And thank you so much for doing this interview with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Legend. And thank you for all the work that you've put into. It's fantastic. It's been really good and light. Oh, thank you. And solutions focused, like you, uh, exactly. you're saying exactly. as well, you know. Great. Yeah, well, and also we've been sharing all along, we've been sharing the GB Thinker and the the uh, the different episodes, the different um, episodes, no, different issues or issues, issues. Yeah. that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Sam, thank you so, so much for talking with me today. Legend, thank you so much, Roberto. Have a lovely day.